Today, we're going to be looking at the Pokemon Prime. The Pokemon Prime from Heart Gold and Soul Silver sets are one of the strangest set gimmicks ever printed because they have no special rules. Their whole gimmick was that they were stronger than other Pokemon. Even though this is a worst of list, many of the Pokemon on here still saw some niche play just because they were designed to be powerful. Starting off this list at number 10, we have Scizor Prime. This Pokemon is a stage 1 Pokemon with 100 HP, a powerful Pokebody, and attack. Its red armor Pokebody prevented all damage done to it from Pokemon with special energies attached. Its metal scissors attack costs 1 metal, 1 colorless energy, and 30 damage plus 20 for each metal energy attached to it. If you had 2 metal energies attached to Scizor Prime, this attack dealing 70 damage would often be enough to secure 2 hit KOs against many of the format's best attackers as well as pick off evolving support Pokemon. With special metal energy reducing all damage it took by 10 and its red armor Pokebody, Scizor could be an extremely difficult Pokemon for certain strategies to deal with. This card is not bad by any means, which is why it's at the top of this worst of list. The real issue with Scizor Prime when it was in Standard was that the formats it existed during could not have been more hostile towards its success. Before the Diamond and Pearl expansions rotated out of the format with the release of Black and White, Scizor had intense competition with Dialga G Level X as a difficult to answer Steel type, although it did see play regardless. Once that card rotated out of the format and Scizor had a chance to shine, Reshiram and Zekrom released and became extremely popular. Zekrom's Bolt Strike dealing 120 damage was extremely problematic for Scizor, since it could even one-hit KO through two special metal energy. Reshiram, the deck that was arguably more popular for a long time, would be able to one-hit KO Scizor with an Outrage attack if the Scizor player had damaged it at any point with Metal Scissors. These decks also tended to play very few, if any, special energy, meaning Scizor would constantly be at threat of being knocked out. While Scizor Prime isn't a bad card by any means, it just wasn't as played as other Pokemon Prime due to having stiff competition or being in formats extremely hostile to it. At number 9 on this list, we have Tyranitar Prime. While it's a little strange to have a card that made top 8 of the 2011 US Nationals on this list, this card ran into similar issues as the previously mentioned Scizor Prime. Tyranitar Prime decks were built around dealing damage with its Darkness Howl attack, dealing 20 damage to each non-Darkness type Pokemon in play for a single Darkness energy. With a double colorless energy, players could use its Power Claw and Megaton Tail attacks to pick up important KOs on larger HP Pokemon. This Pokemon was usually combined with other cards that could heal your own Pokemon of the Darkness Howl damage and make Tyranitar harder to kill such as Nidoqueen and Superior, whose respective Maternal Comfort and Royal Heal abilities would heal all the Tyranitar player's Pokemon. Unfortunately, this style of deck proved to be outclassed by other decks built around other powerful Stage 2 Pokemon. Generally, if you wanted to play a powerful Stage 2, building around Magnezone Prime was better since its magnetic draw Pokepower provided the player with an incredible draw engine as well as its Lost Burn attack being able upwards of 200 damage with proper setups such as Embor, enough to knock out any Pokemon at the time. This deck was so powerful that it actually won the 2011 World Championship. And unfortunately for Tyranitar Prime, it was a terrible matchup. Because of this, after Tyranitar Prime got its national top 8, it fell off the face of the tournament results after people realized Magnezone was extremely strong. Even though Tyranitar is fairly powerful, it could only put up poor performances in the meta of the time. Taking the number 8 spot, we have Houndoom Prime. Although its attack is unimpressive, this Pokemon mainly saw fringe play for its Fire Breath Poke Power. Once per turn on a coin flip, Houndoom Prime could burn the opponent's active Pokemon. Back when this card was released in 2010, the burn status condition worked a little differently. When a Pokemon is burned, the player whose Pokemon it is flips a coin, and if they flip tails, two damage counters are put on that Pokemon. If they flipped heads, the condition would not be cured unlike today. Since the damage from the burn wasn't guaranteed, Houndoom Prime's Pokepower only had a 25% chance to deal any damage on its own the turn it's used. However, there were other decks that could take advantage of the burn while this card was in standard. When combined with Blaziken FB Level X, Houndoom could enable its Burning Spirit Pokebody to make Blaziken FB Level X's Blaze Shoot Attack deal an incredible 120 damage, enough to one-hit KO most Pokemon at the time. After Blaziken rotated out of the format, 
Players could use Houndoom Prime in decks built around Leafeon's Miasma Wind Attack, which for one energy dealt 50 damage for each status condition affecting the opponent's active Pokémon. Depending on whether you attached a Psychic or Grass energy, Leafeon could deal massive damage when combined with Rose Raid's Energy Signal Poke Power that poisoned or confused your opponent's active Pokémon. This strategy was made even more powerful due to the fact that attaching a Rainbow Energy to Rose Raid would count as both types for Energy Signal and give two status conditions at once. With three status conditions on the active Pokémon, Miasma Wind could deal 150 damage and easily knock out any attacker in the format. Unfortunately, this strategy never really caught on since it required way too much setup compared to other decks capable of dealing equally massive damage. If Burn had guaranteed 20 damage in between turns it does today, then Houndoom Prime would have actually been a very solid Pokémon. However, without that guaranteed damage, it was relegated to only seeing play in gimmicky strategies and wound up on this list. In number 7, we have Meganium Prime. The main draw to this card was its Leaf Trans Poke Power that lets you move Grass Energy attached to your Pokémon to any other of your Pokémon as often as you'd like during your turn. While this effect has seen top meta play around the same time in many different forms, such as Hydreigon Dark Trance or Clinkland's Shift Gear abilities, Meganium Prime had significant downsides compared to both the aforementioned Pokémon. The biggest issue facing Meganium Prime is that there just weren't as many good Grass-type Pokémon to pair with its Poké Power. Since its own attack wasn't very strong, only dealing 80 damage for 2 Grass and 2 Colorless Energy, you needed Pokémon capable of dealing more damage. Unfortunately, the best attacking Grass-type Pokémon at the time, Yan Mega Prime, didn't gain anything from pairing up with Meganium, since its own attacks were usually going to cost no energy thanks to its inside Pokébody. Its Fire-type weakness was also a massive issue in its standard format due to the prevalence of Reshiram. However, Meganium Prime did see experimentation in the 2012 metagame with the release of Prism Energy providing a way for this card to partner with non-grass-type attackers as well, and the release of Max Potion, giving decks that could move energy around a powerful healing payoff. Since Prism Energy and the previously printed Rainbow Energy counted as all energy types in play, it could be moved with Leaf Trans. If you had a Meganium Prime in play, you could move all energy off of one of your attackers, heal it fully with Max Potion at no cost, and then move the energy back onto it. Unfortunately, Clinkling actually benefited more from these cards printing due to being more consistent since the entire evolution line could be searched out of the deck with Heavy Ball, an item card that lets you add any Pokemon with a retreat cost of 3 or more from your deck to your hand. Even if Clinkling hadn't been printed, this card would have still been outclassed by Hydreigon, who not only had a retreat cost of 3 for Heavy Ball, but could also abuse powerful item cards that cared about Dark Energy like Dark Patch. Meganium Prime deserves its spot on this list for being thoroughly outclassed during its time in the standard format. In the number 6 spot on this list, we have Slow King Prime. This card is similar to the last two in that its Poke Power was the main reason to consider playing it in your deck. Slow King Prime's opponent's choice Poke Power has the effect to reveal the top two cards of your deck and have your opponent pick one of them to go into your hand and the other on the bottom of your deck. Once Claydol rotated out of the standard format, Poke powers and abilities that let you draw cards for no downside were fairly rare. Unfortunately, the Poke powers that did exist were generally significantly better than Slow King Primes. While Magnezone Prime was a stage 2 Pokemon, it was the premier draw engine for many decks due to being able to draw up to 6 cards instead of maxing out at 1 draw, as well as being a powerful attacker. While Slow King Prime could have potentially carved out a niche for itself due to being a stage 1 Pokemon, your opponent being the player who picked the card that actually went to your hand was the nail in the coffin for this card's playability. The real issue with this card was that you would never draw the card you needed off of its Poke Power. Since your opponent got to pick, if you revealed a good card and a bad card for the situation, you would never get the good one. The only time opponent's choice would draw you into a specific card you needed would be when two copies of it are revealed from the top of your deck. Sadly, that downside would be all that was needed to bar this card from seeing any sort of competitive play, giving it this spot on the list. At the halfway point, we have Crobat Prime. This Pokemon is a stage 2 with 130 HP and 2 attacks. Its first attack, Severe Poison, poisons the defending Pokemon for 1 Psychic Energy. But, 4 damage counters are put on them between turns instead of the usual one. 
Its second attack, Skill Dive, costs 1 Psychic Energy and does 30 damage for any of your opponent's Pokémon. For a Stage 2 Pokémon, these attacks are absolutely terrible. The only real redeeming factor this card has going for it are its low energy cost and free retreat, the format actually being part of the reason it's not lower on this list. At the time this card was around, it's pretty laughably outclassed by other Stage 2 Pokémon that can provide more damage or better utility, such as Magnezone Prime. This class also had the unfortunate quality of being wholly outclassed by Yon Mega Prime, the best Stage 1 attacker at the time. Yon Mega Prime's attacks were pretty much strict upgrades over Crobat Prime's, with Linear Attack dealing 40 damage to any Pokémon instead of 30, and Sonic Boom dealing 70 damage to the active Pokémon instead of giving it a harsher poison effect. These attacks would also not require any energy attachment thanks to Yon Mega's Insight Pokébody that made them cost no energy if both players had the same number of cards in their hand. Crobat Prime being outclassed by a Stage 1 that was better than it in every way was a dead nail for its viability in a majority of cases. However, there was a single deck that could occasionally take advantage of Crobat Prime's unique properties. Decks built around Mew Prime's Sea Off attack and its Lost Link Pokebody would occasionally use Crobat Prime as a win condition. For Sea Off, a 1 Psychic Energy would let you put any Pokemon from your deck into the Lost Zone so that its attacks could be used by Mew later in the game. When combined with Undaunted Mux Sludge Drag, a move costing 1 Psychic Energy that switches the defending Pokémon for any of their bench Pokémon, and then poisons and confuses the new active, the Mew player could trap Pokémon that were difficult to retreat into the active spot. When combined with Vileplume's Allergy Flower Pokébody that stopped both players from using trainers, the equivalent of items at the time, this could be an incredibly potent lock. Since Crobat Prime and Muk shared the same attack cost of a single Psychic Energy, the Mew player could see off a Crobat while a useless Pokémon is trapped in the active spot, and start using Skill Dive to slowly pick away at their opponent's bench for no further energy investment. Although this was a good way to close out games for the deck, Mew Prime decks also frequently played Yon Mega, which could fulfill the same exact role at the cost of one more Grass Energy. Crobat Prime wasn't a mainstay in this style of deck, but it did have a legitimate niche, saving it from being further down this list. At the number 4 spot, we have Raichu Prime. It's a stage 1 Electric-type Pokémon with 100 HP, the Voltage Increase Poké Power, and the Mega Thunderbolt Attack. Voltage Increase has the effect of letting the player move as much Electric Energy to Raichu from their other Pokémon as they like, a good Poké Power for setting up its attack. Mega Thunderbolt costs 2 Electric Energy and 1 Colorless Energy to deal 120 damage with the downside of having to discard all energy attached to it. When combined with Call of Legends Pachirisu's self-generation Poké Power that lets you attach up to 2 Electric Energy to it when you play it from your hand, you could Mega Thunderbolt as early as turn 2. This setup wasn't very consistent as it required a lot to go right in order to work, so it never really saw top table success but it did still have its merits. Up until the release of Black and White Base Set, 120 damage was a really good amount that could use one hit KO a majority of non-stage 2 Pokémon. Even after the release of Black and White and the introduction of Reshiram and Zekrom, two incredibly powerful and popular Pokémon with 130 HP, Raichu decks could still take the KO in one hit with a card like Plus Power. The real issue facing Raichu's viability was that Zekrom outclassed it when competing for an already small niche. Decks built around Zekrom, Pachirisu, and Shaman Celebration Wind Poké Power, which lets you move energy around as much as you wanted when you play from your hand, were very popular due to a turn 1 Bolt Strike for the same energy cost and a damage as Mega Thunderbolt being very difficult for some decks to come back from. Raichu having basic Pokemon counterpart that did equal damage for an equal cost was already bad enough, but Bolt Strike also had a less harsh downside, only dealing 40 damage to Zekrom instead of forcing the player to discard all energies attached to it. This meant that the Zekrom player didn't have to constantly set up the Pachirisu and Shaman combo to continue throwing off powerful attacks. Raichu Prime decks were ultimately too janky to take advantage of its potential upsides, giving it the number 4 spot on this list. Speaking of a deck that was a little too hard to enable, in number 3 we have Espeon Prime. 
This card is a stage 1 Pokemon that potentially enabled a very interesting Eeveelutions deck with its Evolution Memories Pokebody. For those that don't know, Eeveelution is a term used to describe any Pokemon that involves from Eevee. This Pokebody lets Espeon Prime use the attacks of any Pokemon you had in play that evolved from Eevee as long as it had the necessary energy to do so. While this Pokebody isn't necessarily bad, there were very few playable Eeveelutions at the time to go along with it. The main idea behind wanting to use Espeon Prime would be to use the attacks of your other Eeveelutions while giving yourself a better type matchup against the opponent's Pokemon, or to take advantage of Espeon Prime's 100 HP being higher than the other Eeveelutions in the deck. Unfortunately, there just weren't many good psychic weak Pokemon to take advantage of the potential type changing upside and most evolutions had 90 HP, so there wasn't any real merit to playing an Espeon Prime as it didn't help avoid two hit KOs. In fact, the best evolution at the time, Umbreon, had its Moonlight Fang attack, which dealt 30 damage for a single darkness energy, as well as making it immune to damage from attacks of Pokemon with any Pokebodies or Pokepowers. Umbreon was already good enough to see play, and decks using it didn't care enough about possible type coverage to want to run Espeon Prime. Had there been more good Eeveelution cards to take advantage of it, this card might have seen some play. Even still, it's actually not the worst Pokemon Prime Evolution. Coming in as the second worst Pokemon Prime of all time, we have Umbreon Prime. While this Pokemon has some incredibly interesting attributes, they couldn't ever amount to anything. Its cloud-covered moon Poke Power had the effect of returning itself and all cards attached to it to your hand as long as Umbreon Prime is your active Pokemon, and you could get heads on a coin flip. It also had the powerful attack Evoblast, which costs 1 darkness energy and 2 colorless energy to deal 50 damage plus 10 more for each Pokemon you had in play that evolved from Eevee, including itself. This attack could deal up to 110 damage as easily as the second turn with cards like double colorless energy and a full bench of Eeveelutions. It could also have this already high damage increased by 10 if any special darkness energy were attached to it. While this card seems good on paper, it had some incredibly terrible flaws that stopped it from seeing any serious play. Not only did it have the same issue as Espeon Prime, where there were no good evolutions, it also couldn't have matched up worse into the premier attacking threat of the format, Donphan Prime. Since Umbreon Prime was weak to fighting types, Donphan's Earthquake would take easy one-hit KOs against it for only a single fighting energy and some minor damage to the Donphan player's benched Pokemon. Not only did this pretty much render Cloud Covered Moon completely useless, but it was also extremely difficult for the Umbreon player to get the KO in return. Since Donphan Prime functionally had 140 HP due to its exoskeleton Pokebody reducing all damage it takes by 20, an Umbreon Prime would need to have 6 Eeveelutions in play and 3 special darkness energy attached. Even if the Eeveelutions player used an Espeon Prime to attack instead to get around the fighting weakness, the Donphan player could just look for 2 hit KOs that would still put them ahead since Evoblast costs significantly more energy than Earthquake. One way Eeveelutions decks could try to get around this would be using the previously mentioned Umbreon. Decks running Donphan Prime usually played ways to get around it, often using Yon Mega Prime's linear attack to deal damage to other benched Pokemon and switch out to the healthier Yon Mega once it got low. While the card has some good aspects that keep it from being the worst Pokemon Prime, it just couldn't make a deck built around it good. Finally, the card with the dishonor of being the worst Pokemon Prime is Ampharos Prime. The only reason to potentially consider this Pokemon was its conductivity Pokebody, which puts a damage counter on your opponent's Pokemon whenever they attach an energy from their hand to it. If this Pokebody was on a basic Pokemon, it might have seen some niche play. Unfortunately, it was brought down to unplayable status due to being on a stage 2 Pokemon with a fighting type weakness. As previously mentioned, Danfon Prime was an incredibly common attacker. And although it couldn't KO Ampharos Prime in a single hit, it also didn't care whatsoever about its Pokebody because it needed so little energy to deal high damage. Cards like Yon Mega Prime could also attack for no energy cost whatsoever. This meant that Ampharos Prime was completely useless against two of the format's most common attackers. Even if you disregard these poor matchups, since Ampharos Prime's Lightning Crush attack did too little damage for too high of a cost, it was only really usable as a support Pokemon. In this role, however, it was outclassed by Magnezone Prime, whose additional draw power and much stronger attack gave it a home in a wide variety of decks. 
This ubiquity of a significantly better stage 2 Pokemon meant that no players seriously considered Ampharos Prime in their decks. This card is just unimpressive in every way, earning the title of the worst Pokemon Prime. This was definitely a stranger top 10 worst of video since a lot of the Pokemon Prime did see play in some capacity, but we hope you enjoyed it. If you thought any other Pokemon Prime deserved to be on this list, let us know in the comments below.